you know, I forgot. The thought of the day, and I assigned that table over there to <laughs> come up. I mean, there are that. four wonderful, smart men at that I table. We came up come with up okay. with the thought of the day. I'll do it. The thought of the day, in real cooperation, go Hawks. <laughs> Remember, yeah, that's good. I mean, yeah, right. won't forget hey, that. No, we won't. What, what did I get? Yeah. Go all the way to Green Bay. <laughs> that had to be tough for you. To it say. was, but in clear to cooperation, you know, because we're talking about alliances, <laughs> and they're the NFC, and you got to appreciate a good team. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, members and guests, good morning. Welcome to another beautiful day in Port Angeles. And despite the heavy rains and severe winds, it is. Clallam County is ready to set a record for sales tax revenue. The motel and hotel lodging tax is going to be its previous two years of record setting income. If you look at the newspaper, our unemployment numbers are dropping. This is all great indications of a rebounding economy. And today we want to dig in a little deeper to not only what's happening in Washington, but how partnerships and alliances can further increase and improve our business atmosphere. With that said, today we have our speaker, who is not only known to us as the Port of Port Angeles Commissioner, but she is newly elected as the President of the Washington Business Alliance. Please welcome me, or please join me in welcoming no stranger to this group, Colleen McAleer. Colleen. Thank you. So thank you very much for having me here today. Will you focus it, please? That's her father. Point at, yeah. Colleen, yes. I didn't. I will, I will. Thank you. So um, Thank you for having me here today. I'm here as uh, the president and chief operating officer. I was hired by the board of directors uh, of the Washington Business Alliance. Uh, I was hired in September. And today I have with me Alan Crane, who is the chairman of our board. He's also the CFO of Kitsap Bank. So, and they have a branch here in Port Angeles and in Squim, I believe, and, and several across the state. So, uh, this is Alan Crane, and he, uh, we're happy to have him join us today. Can you uh, sit here and scroll for me? Oh, that's right. Since we don't have a clicker. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so. <coughs> Quickly, we are uh, the Washington Business Alliance, and our signature initiative is Plan Washington. <coughs> it is a strategic plan for the state in six different areas. I'll go over that, uh, but uh, I'll give Alan an opportunity now to talk a little bit about how we were formed in our story, since he was part of that when it occurred. So. Alan, if you'll sure. take this first slide for me. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, morning. Pleasure to be here. Uh, when Colleen uh, actually invited me to come join her, I jumped at the opportunity because uh, I started at Kitsap Bank about two years ago. Haven't had the opportunity to come out to the peninsula since I've been there. As I was telling a few people before, I used to audit regularly out here back many years ago. A number of uh, banks on the Olympic Peninsula, Northwestern National, happened to be an audit client of mine. So. I have a lot of fond memories of coming to Port Angeles, and, uh, and I truly mean that. So I'm a Northwest native and uh, have enjoyed the great resources across our state. I lived for about 15 years in eastern Washington, was CFO for a bank over in, uh, in Wenatchee, Cashmere Valley Bank, if you happen to be familiar with the name. I happened to, uh, through that experience with Cashmere Valley Bank, um, ended up in a, uh, we had a B&O tax audit. And I did not like the result of the B&O tax audit, nor did our board or our CEO. So we chose to sue the state over their findings. Uh, it was actually uh, a fairly well-grounded argument. Uh, we felt we were on solid ground and also wanted to pursue it as a matter of principle because we did not like the approach that the Department of Revenue was taking. We actually took that case all the way to the Supreme Court. It was a complete travesty of justice. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, we did lose. <laughs> uh, and this happens regularly within the state of Washington. I won't get into the whole reason. Some of you may be familiar with this, but uh, the process was very eye-opening and illuminating and disappointing, quite honestly. Hmm. Through that exercise, I ended up at a, uh, 
had a testimony for, uh, for the Senate doing a hearing on uh, changes to the B&O tax code as it applied to financial institutions. And the then current director of the Department of Revenue was also testifying. Uh, some would call it a misrepresentation of facts. I would call it a complete and outright lie as far as what she said in terms of what the original intent of the legislature was when they passed that origin, original uh, implementing regulation. From that meeting, I then went to a luncheon with the AWB. And uh, that was also illuminating. There were a lot of other business people there with the AWB. And uh, what I saw from comments from other people, I forgot to mention, speaking at that luncheon was the director of the Department of Revenue, who I just testified uh, with uh, in, the, in that Senate, Senate hearing. Uh, and she made a number of comments that obviously incensed other business owners there in that room. And I realized, well, they're doing this with everyone. So it wasn't just a poor little cash belly bank of financial institutions. This was every, every business entity was basically uh, at a had an adversarial perspective from the Department of Revenue. That seemed to me not to be the way we want our government to run. Ser through serendipity, I crossed paths with the formation of the Washington Business Alliance. Howard B. Carr and David Giuliani were the co-founders. I don't know if you're familiar with those names. David Giuliani is a co-inventor and co-founder of Sonicare, Claire Sonic. Howard B. Carr was president of International <coughs> Operations for Starbucks. So he took Howard Schultz's concept and spread it across the world. Uh, two completely opposed political viewpoints of those two gentlemen. Both of them at the same time found themselves complaining incessantly about what was going on in the state government and why nothing was being done. And they realized they were just complaining and not doing anything about it. And they wanted to be part of the solution. And they saw an opportunity for the business community to be part of the solution. And as opposed to engaging in a fight and drawing lines in the sand and saying no, the Business Alliance is much more about how do we get to outcomes that make sense. And let's not fight over whether taxes are too high or too low. We all have opinions about that. But let's get to what do we want the state to achieve? How do we want our resources to be expended? And what goals do we want to achieve with that? That's what you do in your business every single day. You set a goal and an outcome. You create a budget, a business plan to achieve that. You hold yourself accountable to that. And where you miss, you fine tune, readjust, and keep moving forward. The state despite its annual 70 plus billion spend in money, has no strategic plan. There is no strategic plan for the state of Washington as far as what they want to achieve with that dollar expenditure. That, to me, with my CPA, CFO background, seems almost criminal. But it's just part of the process of government. We have formed the, the Washington Business Alliance to get into what are the goals we want to achieve? And it's not set by the business alliance. It's set by the membership and it's set by engagement with the broader business community and elected and appointed government officials. To actually be at the table and engage in a constructive conversation to get to an outcome. To get past the partisan fighting. To use data and information as our source and our reference. And to chart an outcome that we can all be satisfied with. That may seem like an awfully tough stretch. I know a number of people are very skeptical that that can happen. I know at the formation as we were, we were getting started, many people said that's impossible. But it's not. We've made good progress. We've got good results to show for that. Colleen's going to speak to some of those. We also have an example. This has actually been set by the Oregon, Oregon Business Alliance. They started a little over a decade ago. And in that time, they went from near bottom in GDP <coughs> per capita to one of the top in the country. So we can see that there are examples where this model works. We've seen that we've had success in track record. The next iteration, quite honestly, is just as you are doing here, is uh, we would invite you to participate as members in whatever form that may take, either individually or collectively as an organization. Uh, numbers help. Uh, and also, you know, we are the Washington Business Alliance. I work in Fort Orchard. Colleen's obviously based out here in Port Angeles, but we want a broader representation across the state. Across the state, yes, we did form in Seattle. There's a density of business numbers in Seattle, but at no shape, of, at no point in time, has never been our intent that it would be Seattle focused or even Puget Sound focused. But it represents all communities uh, and all people across the state of Washington. Uh, Kitsap Bank is a member. Um, and we feel very strongly that we have to invest and need to invest in the communities that we serve. We're glad to see that our, our friends from First Federal are here also, and they're also uh, members of, uh, of the, uh, the Washington Business Alliance. Kitsap Bank, our primary customer are small and medium business owners. And unless those business, that business environment thrives, not just survives, but thrives, our organization is out of business. 
So we believe very strongly in this cause to invest in endeavors that uh, force the state to invest in the economies that we serve as well, because that is what will truly raise the prosperity for all of us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Colleen, who is, we're actually very excited, you know her better than I do, but we're actually very excited to have her as our executive director. She has uh, taken the bull by the horns in a very short period of time, really uh, demonstrated some phenomenal leadership for us. She already had great great contacts with the state, and she's further leverage though. So thank you, Colleen, and it's all yours. Well, thanks for coming with me today, Alan. So if you'll scroll oh, forward yeah, and drive sure. it. Yeah. So uh, every, that's a, yeah, um, so quickly though, why, why was it formed? The businesses across, several prominent business owners wanted to see the state apply some business metrics, i.e. strategic plan, to the state's goals. And uh, and they it specifically is data driven, scrupulously bipartisan, and then using civility and uh, a, a very collaborative, inclusive nature. Um, these are these are our plan Washington doc uh, booklets. Uh, annually, we update these. So this was done last year. We are just about ready to put out the new version. Uh, I understand our new version came to our office, but it happened yesterday after I left Seattle. So these are out, but and these are the last of uh, the Plan Washington booklets from last year. So I will hand these out at the end, not now. So I have your full attention, <laughs> but uh, I know that lesson. Uh, so, and these are some of the things that the Washington Business Alliance has been able to achieve since it was formed in 2010. It's a really influential organization. Uh, under Greg, Governor Gregoire's admi administration, they worked with Senator Castema, our government affairs director is his son, Isaac Castema. They were able to get a balanced budget in 2011. <coughs> there was much more business leader engagement through the Washington Business Alliance, and, and there was a, a much stronger business focus on stormwater regulations. Then under Governor Inslee's administration, he had been uh, talking about lean and implementing that <coughs> into uh, the agencies of, the, of Washington State. And I, was, I've, I attended a uh, lean transformation conference in Tacoma where they asked me to speak 2,800 people uh, attended, and there is an expert in lean governance at the state level. His name's John Bernard. He wrote the book, Government That Works. And I asked him afterwards, well, which state, what are the states to model as far as lean for at the agency level? And shockingly, well, I was shocked. He told me Washington that Washington is considered the, uh, the state government to emulate, which uh, I guess that should make us feel good, but I was surprised by it. But I've read, since then, I've read a lot of articles about how Washington State has been ahead of this under, I guess it was Governor Locke that began the process trying to take what's done in the manufacturing world and apply that to state government. And so it's been happening, uh, it may not feel that way to us. <laughs> but um, so that was an interesting uh, thing that came out of that presentation. Um, and that was something that the Washington Business Alliance really tried to get Governor Inslee to do is, is they created a, uh, a group within the governor's office called Results Washington that goes around and uh, looks at Department of Ecology, Department of Revenue, and looks at their processes, trying to make them be as effective as possible. So, um, and we had a, in last, in the last session, the Washington Business Alliance promoted Senate Bill 5735, which passed through the Senate. It was sponsored by a Republican, uh, Senator Erickson, and uh, it's, as far as we know, it's the first a bill to reduce carbon ever to be passed in the United States that was promoted by Republicans. So it did not make it through the House, but it did pass through the Senate. So we'll go over that a little bit more. So a little bit about these Plan Washington documents. It covers six areas. 
those areas are economic development, education, the environment, uh, governance, health care, and transportation. So those are the six areas that the Washington Business Alliance determined <coughs> were the important things that government should be doing and providing in a really robust way for our citizens <coughs> of Washington State. And here, so I, I know this community, I know what's important to us and where we feel we need a little bit more help from the state. And so uh, the economic growth strategies within uh, Plan Washington and our new update, so it's not in this one, but since I've become the uh, president of the Washington Business Alliance, I've been able to put in some things that I felt were important to our state, which includes sustainable timber harvest. And uh, so it's under the environmental section, but it's also addressed in the, uh, in the uh, economic section. And again, this is updated annually. So next year, when we do this again, and we're gonna do a bit of a road show, uh, my intent is that we get input and potentially that be one of the strategies and recommendations under the economic development section as well. Uh, so some of the things that we've gotten here is to, um, to ensure we have a sustainable timber harvest, that we invest in the Washington Tourism Act, uh, we harmonize government regulations, and expand tax incentives for distressed regions. That was one uh, that last item, there were recommendations that Bill Greenwood made, and he talked to some of my staff, and we blogged about it. And most of the senators and representatives from the state receive our blog, and several of our legislators contacted us and said, "This is really a good idea. Why don't? Why do we only have incentives for manufacturers in distressed regions?" Why don't we also have it for service-oriented companies? So uh, that's now going to be proposed. There's legislation that's being written now so that that is also offered to the um, to distressed counties across the state. So you, you can thank uh, this community and, and Bill Greenwood for that idea because that we'll see if it gets passed. But you know, it, it's uh, it's something that we've already been able to affect. So I'm excited about that. Um, so those are under statewide growth, not just focusing on the central Puget Sound, but rural communities as well. 25% of our population lives in rural communities outside the central Puget Sound and outside of Spokane. So, you know, one out of four people need to be taken care of also. So that's, and there's a lot of activity obviously that's happening in the central Puget Sound and we want to make sure that that same kind of prosperity is occurring across the state in rural communities such as Port Angeles, Swim, Forks, <coughs> Clallam Bay, etc. So the next strategy is to complete, compete globally to uh, expand those tax incentives for distressed regions. And uh, I, I'm on the Center of Excellence Board uh, for Aerospace and Advanced Manufacturing. And you'll notice I got that in there too. They, uh, the Centers of Excellence really do an exceptional job for the community and technical colleges across the state. They focus on, they work with uh, an industry and they bring to the table what skill sets and what the new focus is for each of these industry areas and then give that information to the 34 community technical colleges that are, uh, that have classes in that industry's expertise area. And so it's a, in a really efficient way to go and they get an, a massive amount of funding brought to this state from the federal level. They, each center of excellence gets about $200,000 annually and, uh, but yet they leverage that to bring in, uh, the Air Washington grant was $26 million for our states, and which Peninsula College did get um, some of that funding for courses in aerospace. So uh, the next is more uh, stronger entrepreneurial supports is another thing we're advocating <coughs> for, and then uh, energizing tech transfers from universities and Pacific Northwest National Labs. 
So we have two major initiatives that we're working on. One is called Career Tech. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar in uh, our K-12 systems, we have basic education and within that is hands-on applied training. Uh, and so the intent here, which I've, I've heard over and over when you talk to Westport, you talk to ACTI, and this is the case not just in this county, but across the state. If you, if you talk to Boeing, if you talk to Bigger, if you talk to BNSF, lots of different companies, allied health companies, construction companies, they, there's been such a focus on the need for four-year degrees and STEM education that is very important that part of the need, the story, has been lost. For There have been a lot of studies now that for every person in, our, in today's economy that, you need, that needs to have a master's degree or higher, you need two people with an undergraduate degree, the four-year degree. But you need seven, seven people that have a, a skill, a trade, have technical capacity, and so that's 70%. 70% of our workforce today does not require the four-year degree. Yet today, in our high school system, the whole focus is on getting everybody into a four-year degree program. So it's a bit of a mismatch. We have today ninth graders, the ninth graders of, uh, of eight years ago, only 18% are graduating from a, from a four-year degree. So that means 82% of our kids are not graduating with a four-year degree. And yet the whole entire focus of our high schools today are about getting kids prepared for that four-year university. When in reality it's not happening and also it's not what the workforce needs. So um, the focus is to deliver excited and engaged 18-year-olds that haven't tuned out, aren't bored to tears, and I'm a mom, 15 and 17 year old boys, uh, and they take these career and technical education classes. And I've sat on CTE advisory board, so I have that experience. As you all know, I've been involved with Peninsula College with the Composite Recycling Technology Center. So I have a background in this, and I truly recognize that we're missing the boat. We are losing kids, especially those marginal kids, that if we could get them engaged, then we could do a much better job at, at integrating them into a really productive job in society. And so we've got the need from the business perspective. And uh, our, some of our partners, League of Education Voters, I, I dare to say they're the most influential nonprofit in this state as far as education is concerned. They, along with the Manufacturing Industrial <coughs> Council, the Washington Maritime Federation, OSPI, uh, Washington Association of Career and Technical uh, Education, and private sector labor unions, have approached us and asked us to lead this campaign. They want this campaign led by business. They don't want to be advocating for themselves. If education says, we need this, it's we need more testing. No, we don't need more testing. Oh, we don't know what, what we need. And so specifically, business has a need. And they've asked us to bring together the construction industry, the maritime industry in the state, the uh, aerospace and manufacturing industries, allied health. There's all a really great need there. And the focus is on K-12, to getting those kids prepped and excited so that they're ready to go into either an apprenticeship program or a one or two year degree certificate program at our really exceptional community technical colleges across the state. So that's what that's about. And our next, uh, our next one, you can barely see this, is Low Carbon <coughs> Prosperity. That's our second initiative that probably is a little bit more um, uh, impactful for the timber community, especially here in Port Angeles. So this is a slide, we wanted to make sure everybody's aware of this, just a little background. This is a slide, here's the United States' uh, CO2 emissions, and, and here's Washington State. As you can see, because of all the hydropower that we have in our state, we are really an outlier. We are unique. 
among all states. No other state has anything even close to this kind of spread where our electric power is only 11% of the carbon emissions in this state, where or carbon CO2 equivalent, uh, so that takes into account the greenhouse gases, compared to the rest of the United States, the electric sector produces 40% of the carbon emissions. So, and where the majority of, and so this is from 2013, the majority of our emissions come from the transportation sector cars and trucks. So, and here's, um, here is uh, a, a look going forward. Um, again, the United States and Washington State. This is the electric sector, so that 11% that, that you saw previously. Here, look how much power comes from hydro in our state compared to overall in the United States, it's only 6%. So as in the, in the um, <coughs> U.S. we're at 40 percent is coal, but in our state it's six percent, and that is through Puget Sound Energy. And that coal strip is expected to close down in the next year, so that is going to be reduced even further. So here, this is what lo uh, low carbon prosperity is about: uh, is that is that we go ahead and phase out coal for our state uh, out of the electric grid and uh, in the 2020s, but not absolutely shut it down. Puget Sound Energy owns uh, two mines in Montana, and uh, so that's 40% of where Puget Sound Energy gets their power, so we can't, you know, it, it needs to be a phased approach, which uh, Puget Sound Energy understands that that needs to be the case, and there's a lot of entities working on that right now. And, and of course the governor wants to see that, that power no longer source our state. Uh, then, and also switch transportation and industrial processes to our clean hydro energy whenever we can. And then the last is to invest in carbon reduction investments, such as uh, new solutions, techno technological solutions that lower greenhouse gas emissions, and also expand sequestration, and that's where sustainable timber harvests come into play. So here's, here's the goal. In 30, 2035, the, the revised code of Washington says that the state needs to get to 60 uh, carbon, carbon dioxide uh, equivalent what is it, million, million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent by 2035. And, and right now, without doing anything, we'd be at 107, but with sequestration, what we have currently, if they consider sequestration as an opportunity to reduce the carbon, we reduce it by 30, so that's, the net is 77, we have to get to 60. So that, that changes the equation quite a bit if we're considering uh, the carbon sequestration, the absorption that forests, the trees have in absorbing that carbon. So this, thanks to Harry, this came from Elaine O'Neill from Quorum. I'll let you, Quorum is the Consortium of Renewable Resources and Industrial Materials. Good enough. <laughs> uh, and it, uh, so Elaine O'Neill is a professor at the University of Washington, and this is the, this is a, an organization that is that ha, you know it is heavy and credible research, and they are showing that in here's so here's what happens with a uh, with a forest and a tree. So the from about thir when a tree is about thirty. 30 years old, or 25 or so, to 70, that's when a tree is absorbing carbon. After a tree is about 70 years old, it no longer is in a big way absorbing that carbon, as you can see. So if you really were going to use the forest as a carbon-eating machine, uh, then you would you know, let the trees grow until they hit 70 years old, then you, or, it, you know, some point, and, and then you harvest them, and then you replant. 
And that is a, this is a, it, it, the, in Paris they're talking about this, and it would take a lot of uh, forestation to really make a big impact, but we have this, and yet in the public, the whole conversation has been about protecting trees and protecting the forest. And it's not seen as a slow growing crop. And we need to change that story. And because the Washington Business Alliance has such strong ties and relationships with the green environmental groups in Seattle, I, the Washington Business Alliance is, I think, perfectly positioned to change that mindset and start working on changing that story uh, in Seattle and in Olympia. So here, um, is a, a recap of this showing that uh, if we optimize the harvest cycle and then we displace high carbon materials such as steel and concrete with wood materials and then we then we can reuse or convert that into energy so that would it would uh, pull the co2 out of the atmosphere through the trees then we'll leverage the co2 reduction um, and then permanently capture the carbon dioxide and have that, uh, that emission savings. So this is all part of the low carbon prosperity proposal and initiative that we're bringing to the public and to the legislature. So another, another way to reduce this is through electric vehicles. Uh, and let's see, so electric fuel cells is We've had some research done by a lot of our different partners generate six times more jobs than the sale of, uh, through sales of fossil fuels. Um, and so because, because Washington State uh, gets its energy through hydro rather than coal, then that means that uh, a, a electric vehicle, the equivalent of an electric vehicle compared to a fossil fuel, a gas, uh, vehicle that if you were going to compare them side to side the gas vehicle would have to get 383 miles to the gallon to compare it uh, to an electric vehicle that's powered by hydro power in our state as far as carbon emissions yes Do you know why it's what accounts for the six times more jobs in the idea there uh, it's so it, the through hydro and through all the processes that uh, are the jobs that are created uh, in that industry, in the electric sector, uh, compared to fossil fuels, it's just when you compare them uh, side by side, for every gallon of fuel that's uh, created in the, in the uh, oil and gas industry compared to what it delivers in the electric industry, there's six times more jobs. So you get any idea why? I mean, is it building new infrastructure? Or? I think that's part of it, yeah. I, I, there's uh, research behind that, I just didn't include it here. My staff created this slide for me. Okay. All right, so this is, uh, got two more slides here. The Business Alliance, and why I was so attracted to the Business Alliance, is because, to me, they, they are an altruistic organization. They're an alliance, not an association. An association typically is your members, who are the big players of your membership, who are paying dues, and then you do what your paying membership wants you to do. And that's not what the association, the alliance, Business Alliance, is about. We have a lot of uh, wealthy funders from the Seattle area and uh, um, that are really altruistic in nature and they want to see the entire state thrive and they really want to do what's in the best interest of all Washingtonians. And so we are not at all a special interest group, we are more a general interest group. And because we really are trying to make the state better in these six different categories. Um, and so that, that's something that really appeals to me is I've always fought for the little guy and uh, I feel that, that often rural communities and the underserved, the, the, that demographic that is uh, you know, at the lower end of the, um, the income scale is often not represented well at Ann Olympia. And so this, this organization, does that and 
Uh, the fact that they hired me, who comes from a rural community, to lead their organization, I think really speaks to that. And, um, and the only way that we are really going to make a difference is if the rural communities, the, the ethnic chambers of commerce, uh, get together and have a really strong, loud coalition. And to be honest, uh, the, I've heard over and over in Seattle that, oh, when Seattle asks for something, they're always asking for something, and you know, we need to help out the rest of the state. And so this is a great opportunity for the rest of the state, the rural communities, to get together and, and then start saying, hey, you know, the, this system is not equitable and you're not allowing us to thrive based on the natural resources that we've historically been able to rely upon. So, and lastly, um, I readily admit when I talk to folks, I know our story here and I have a bias. So when I am in Seattle and I'm talking to other businesses and they're you know, talking about, especially in the maritime industry, their frustration over the gentrification of Lake Union and other locations. I, I, I hear very often about this. And, um, you know, Newport Steel, a lot of different companies. Guess what? I'm telling Clallam County's story. And I'm telling the Port of Port Angeles' story to them. So it's a great opportunity uh, that I have to help out this community. So this is my last slide. On uh, June, I'm sorry, December 16th, we're holding a, an event. We have typically quarterly social business uh, development networking events. And uh, you can tell my, uh, my staff is a different generation than I am. <laughs> but uh, so we've, we've called it The Force Awakens. We're rolling out our new Plan Washington. We're rolling out our new website. Uh, the staff has done just a fabulous job with our web developer with uh, a lot of aerial, aerial video footage across the state. And also, uh, I'll be for the first time presenting to a large group in Seattle. Um, I did get uh, Kids at Bank, Alan, to sponsor the event. And it's in, it'll be held uh, at Columbia Grove in Seattle. And uh, if you're interested in signing up and attending, we'd love to have you. So uh, anyway, we would love for the Port Angeles Business Association to be part of the Washington Business Alliance. Uh, entities like um, Phillips Electronics and uh, King County, um, we've got a very large membership, a very influential membership, and uh, love to have this organization or individual businesses join us. Thank you. Ooh. You all know me really, really well, and I'm going to beat John Fayer to this question. What would our dues be for this group? So for an organization, uh, for a nonprofit annually, it is uh, $250 annually. Yeah. Uh, for businesses, it's le with fewer than 25 employees, it's $500. A year and over 25 employees is a thousand dollars a year so we've lowered those because we are trying to get a lot more rural communities and small businesses to join our alliance across the state and and uh, we've got we've got some great interest um, we're really reaching out like Snohomish County uh, anticipate we're gonna have some new board members from that area um, we have representation on our board from Bellingham uh, the deputy King County executive is on our board. So, and now I'm reaching out more into Spokane, Tri-Cities, Wenatchee to have representation there. I'm, I'm kind of representing the Olympic Peninsula as of right now. And, and trust me, I'm, <laughs> I'm representing your interests every opportunity I have. So second question, somebody's gonna raise their hand and want to extend the meeting because they have lots of questions for you. I have promised Colleen she will not be late to the court office. So if you'll keep your questions, do you want to make that motion? I move that up to 15 minutes per to our bylaws, we extend the meeting. Do I have a second? Okay, motion to make. Seconded, all those in favor say aye. Aye. And she gets to blast out that door the very, very minute she needs to. John, Tally, which one goes first? Go ahead. Uh, one energy source you did not mention in your presentation was that of the role of nuclear 
where we, Washington State already has one plant, and some of the new technologies using the liquid metal technology offer great uh, uh, promises for nuclear energy. Could you comment on what the role of nuclear in the state? So it, it here it is it is here. It's not very focused, but yeah, we do have nuclear energy here, and it is clean, and we absolutely are supporting it. We've been working with Energy Northwest. Uh, the, the utilities have come together under a low carbon prosperity utility group. They're meeting again on Thursday. They've asked us to lead their initiative. Um, they, under 111D, which is the Clean Power Act of the EPA, we are cre forming uh, this, thank you, forming the, um, uh, they're working on bills. There's so many bills right now, uh, you know, in this area between the Alliance for Clean Energy and Jobs that they transitioned the last time I met with them. It is now a fee and invest, but it is, you know, they, they shared with me that they are uh, characterizing that because of the polling they've done, they believe they'll be able to pass that initiative if they characterize it as clean energy and forest protection. I went, wow, wait a minute, what about carbon sequestration? And they said, well, we understand that, but it doesn't pull well. So we uh, really need to make sure that that, is, that public relations message is changed. Um, but yeah, Energy Northwest, which represents the nuclear uh, sources, source in the state, is on that, uh, on that commit, that board that we're working with, with the utilities. Hi. With regard to your focus on reducing carbon emissions, uh, does Washington Business Alliance have a position on whether that should occur solely through market forces and technological advances, or whether government regulations, mandates, taxes, or fees also have a role in that? So, so uh, this is what I understand our board has come up with. Uh, so you're talking about putting a price on carbon. So. First and foremost, we believe we ought to be doing the things that uh, lower, and I think maybe I actually have a slide that shows this pretty well. But no, I might have gotten rid of it, I did. Um, so there are things like replacing incandescent lights with LED lights. That, that reduces carbon emissions and it's, it saves us money. So what we are proposing is that you do the things that help our economy and reduce carbons first and foremost. And we can make a huge uh, impact just by doing those things. And all that has been evaluated. McKinsey Inc. has done a lot of research in that regard, and that's been a huge piece of low carbon prosperity. That being said, we live in a blue state. And in order to meet that stated goal, Probably there will have to be uh, either a tax or a cap or something that the voters of Washington State will accept. But go ahead. Oh, go ahead and finish. I'm just going to hand on. No, go ahead. Okay. Right. Part of the challenge with whatever the price on carbon, whether it's cap and trade or a tax, is there's no price that can get us to reducing carbon to where the goals have been set. So some other solution has to come up. The Business Alliance is taking a more agnostic approach of what are things that we do that improve the economy. Because if you apply that heavy a carbon tax of what would need to happen, it would crush the economy. So this is where the, the idea of we need to find alternative solutions to just putting a price on carbon. Secondly, and this is relatively new information, British Columbia did put in place a carbon tax. They're having very mixed to no results with that impact. So there is there is some debate as far as how effective a carbon tax is. Yes. Yeah, Colleen, uh, does your organization take stands, and I say this because I was sitting with our state representative the other night, and he kept talking about the capital gains tax, and he always talks then about, you know, people on Wall Street and the millions or billions they make, and he forgets about the local owner that sells their little, you know, restaurant and suddenly has to pay, you know, this new state tax that he's proposing or he thinks he wants to propose. Question, do you take stands for, against, or We have in? not. You know, we, we really focus on, again, we look at our strategic plan, the plan Washington and the outcome, <coughs> part of it is, you know, how is our state 
We of the 39 counties, uh, 37 of our counties median wage is below the um, below the United States median average. So yes, we've got a couple counties that are doing exceptionally well, but the majority aren't. So from that standpoint, we look at, well, how do we raise the uh, other 35 counties median wage? And so um, we haven't taken specifically a stance on that. We are looking at the outcomes and then specific projects uh, that lie underneath that in the two of them, career tech and low carbon prosperity. Anybody else? Just a comment. Yes. I mean, I think we're very fortunate to have you where you're at. You've done a wonderful job, and I think you ought to be uh, congratulated for all the work that you did in ACTI and everything else in composites. And uh, publicly, I'd like to say thank you for what you've done for the community. Well, thank you. through a B and O tax audit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I have I'm gonna tell you I don't have to, but I'm going to. Four Mondays, two and a half hours, plus my bookkeeper in the store, and at the end of a four year audit, I didn't pay Washington State hundred and thirty seven dollars that I owed them. And so, you know, add up all those man hours, do that wonderful bunch of stuff, and you tell me if that was money wise. Yeah. So anyway, that's my little story. So I know I'm not bitter. It was just funny. Uh, another well anyway, that's the way to go. And I pay my share of B and O. Big time. So someday I'll tell you what I pay for B and O. And and I'm a little store. So don't talk to me about the big guys and what they have to pay and because it doesn't matter. We all get hit with B and O big time. It happens to be one of my passions. So thank you all for coming. See you next Tuesday for our our Oh, you know, I forgot the thought of the day, and I assigned that table over there to Why come up. I mean, there are four wonderful, smart oh, yeah. men at that Andrew table. Came up come with, okay. up with the thought of the day. I'll do it. The thought of the day, in real cooperation, go Hawks. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, yeah, that's good, Andy. Yeah, right. I won't forget hey, that. No, <laughs> we won't. What, what did I get? Yeah. Go all the way to Green Bay. <laughs> It had to be tough for you to It say. was, but in the spirit of cooperation, you know, because we're talking about alliances. <laughs> and they're the NFC, and you got to appreciate a good team. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, members and guests, good morning. Welcome to another beautiful day in Port Angeles. And despite the heavy rains and severe winds, it is. Clallam County is ready to set a record for sales tax revenue. The motel and hotel lodging tax is going to be its previous two years of record setting <coughs> income. If you look at the newspaper. CFO of Kitsap Bank. So, and they have a branch here in Port Angeles and in Squam, I believe, and, and several across the state. So, uh, this is Alan Crane, and he, uh, we're happy to have him join us today. <laughs> Sit here and scroll for me. Oh, that's right. So you don't have a clicker. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> quickly, we are uh, the Washington Business Alliance, and our signature initiative is Plan Washington. <coughs> it is a strategic plan for the state in six different areas. I'll go over that, uh, but uh, I'll give Alan an opportunity now to talk a little bit about how we were formed in our story since he was part of that when it occurred. So 
Alan, if you'll sure. take this first slide, Colleen. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, when Colleen uh, actually invited me to come join her, I jumped at the opportunity because uh, I started at Kitsap Bank about two years ago. Haven't had the opportunity to come out to the peninsula since I've been there. As I was telling a few people before, I used to audit regularly out here back many years ago. A number of uh, banks on the Olympic Peninsula, Northwestern National happened to be an audit client of mine. So, have a lot of fun. Our unemployment numbers are dropping. This is all great indications of a rebounding economy. And today, we want to dig in a little deeper to not only what's happening in Washington but how partnerships and alliances can further increase and improve our business atmosphere. With that said, today we have our speaker, who is not only known to us as the Port of Port Angeles Commissioner, but she is newly elected as the President of the Washington Business Alliance. Please welcome me, or please join me in welcoming no stranger to this group, Colleen McAleer. Colleen. I will, I will. Thank you. So, um, thank you for having me here today. I'm here as uh, the president and chief operating officer. I was hired by the board of directors uh, of the Washington Business Alliance. I uh, was hired in September. And today I have with me Alan Crane, who is the chairman of our board. He's also the fun memories to come to Port Angeles, and, uh, and I truly mean that. So I'm a Northwest native and uh, have enjoyed the great resources across our state. I lived for about 15 years in eastern Washington, was CFO for a bank over in, uh, in Wenatchee, Cashmere Valley Bank, if you happen to be familiar with the name. I happened to, uh, through that experience with Cashmere Valley Bank, um, ended up in a, uh, we had a B&O tax audit, and I did not like the result of the B&O tax audit, nor did our board or our CEO. So we chose to sue the state over their findings. Uh, it was actually uh, a fairly well-grounded argument. Uh, we felt we were on solid ground and also wanted to pursue it as a matter of principle because we did not like the approach that the Department of Revenue was taking. We actually took that case all the way to the Supreme Court. It was a complete travesty of justice. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, we did lose. <laughs> uh, and this happens regularly within the state of Washington. I won't get into the whole reason. Some of you may be familiar with this, but uh, the process was very eye-opening and illuminating. And disappointing, quite honestly. Hmm. Through that exercise, I ended up at a uh, at a testimony for uh, for the Senate, doing a hearing on uh, changes to the B&O tax code as it applied to financial institutions. And the then current director of the Department of Revenue was also testifying. Uh, some would call it a misrepresentation of facts. I would call it a complete and outright lie as far as what she said in terms of what the original intent of the legislature was when they passed that origin, original. Uh, implementing regulation. From that meeting, I then went to a luncheon with the AWB, and uh, that was also illuminating. There were a lot of other business people there with the AWB. And uh, what I saw from comments from other people, I forgot to mention, speaking at that luncheon was the director of the Department of Revenue, who I just testified uh, with uh, in, the, in that Senate, Senate hearing. Uh, and she made a number of comments that obviously incensed other business owners there in that room. And I realized, well, they're doing this with everyone. This wasn't just poor little Cash Valley Bank and financial institutions. This was every, every business entity was basically uh, had, a, had an adversarial perspective from the Department of Revenue. That seemed to me not to be the way we want our government to run. Seren through serendipity, I crossed paths with the formation of the Washington Business Alliance, Howard B. Carr and David Giuliani were co-founders. I don't know if you're familiar with those names. David Giuliani is the co-inventor and co-founder of Sonicare, Claire Sonic. Howard Bihar was president of International <coughs> Operations.